Welcome to the Faith Dialogue Podcast with your host, Pastor Ken Baer. Are you ready to swim in the deep end of the Bible pool or climb to the top of Faith Mountain? If so, open the eyes that see, those ears that hear, and a heart that is receptive. Get your cup of coffee and your Bible as we begin. This is lesson number one in the book of Ephesians. So you're here with us at the very beginning. All right. All right. Let's pray. Father God, we want to thank you that we can open up a new book, this letter to the Ephesians. And Father, we thank you that while Paul wrote it in prison, he wrote it to the church that he founded, that he started in Ephesus. So Lord, allow us to to gather together and, and be that church as well to be able to learn from Paul, the, the great apostle, not only all about Christ, but also all about his church. And we'll give you the praise and the glory for that in Jesus' name, amen. So as I mentioned before, you've got a handout and it has the first 14 or 15 verses of chapter one, and we may get all through those today, maybe not. And on the back of it is some selected verses that if you'd like to, just hang on to that. You can. Uh, put it, use a magnet and put it up on your refrigerator and just take a look at those verses over the next three or four months. Those are, those are amazing verses talking about not only Christ, but also about our attitude and our responsibilities as members of the church. So let me go ahead and, and start reading in chapter one of Ephesians and we'll just see how far we get to go. So Ephesians one, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God, to the saints who are in Ephesus and faithful in Christ Jesus. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ, just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love having predestined us to adoption as sons by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will, to the praise and the glory of his grace by which he made us accepted in the beloved. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins, according to the riches of his grace, which he made to abound towards us in all wisdom and prudence, having been made known to us the mystery of his will according to his good pleasure, which he purposed in himself, that in the dispensation of the fullness of times, he might gather together in all, all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on earth in him. In him also we have obtained an inheritance, being predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will, that we who first trusted in Christ should be on the praise of his glory." In him you also trusted, after you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also, having believed, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession to the praise of his glory. Wow. Did you know that this first 15 verses, the very first 15 verses in the Greek, had no punctuation, it was one complete run-on sentence. One complete run-on sentence. Now, when I was a kid, I went to Catholic school, and the nuns would make us diagram sentences on the blackboard, and they would not have allowed 85 words in one sentence. There's no way they would have allowed that. But the reason I bring that up is for two reasons. One is Paul is using poetry. He's using a form of of Hebrew poetry that's also very familiar with the Greeks in the Greek language. And it's, and it's a beautiful, complete thought. You know, a sentence is supposed to be a thought. And it's amazing that all of these first 13, 14 verses is basically a thought. But the idea is that it has a purpose, a purpose. And that is the glory of Christ. This is what, this is what Christ has done. And Paul is sitting there saying, do you realize what Christ has done, what he's purposed in you. And not only has he purposed in you, but this was planned way before. This was, this was all part of God's plan. God has, a, God has a purpose. You know, one of the things so often that, that people seem to lack is purpose. 
purpose in life. I remember when I went to, to college, one of the first things they wanted you to do is declare a major. You know, what's gonna be your major? And we've gotten away from that. The freshmen now in schools aren't encouraged as often to declare a major up front because a lot of times you, you just don't know. You just don't know what your purpose is. It, it sometimes takes a while. And the people that, the people, the unfortunate thing is that people don't find their purpose are never quite satisfied. They're really never quite satisfied as much as people that know what their purpose is. They know exactly what they're called to do. And that's what Paul is trying to do at the very beginning of this letter. He's trying to give us purpose. And he's giving us purpose because he says we're part of God's plan. From the very beginning, this is all part of God's plan. And that should give us some, some comfort. It's kind of comforting. It's kind of like going on a tour. Has anybody been on a, a tour like of Egypt or Israel or something like that? And when you go and it's the very first time you've ever been there, you go on a tour bus, okay? Because somebody has, knows the way. Somebody knows where they're going. It's the same thing in life. If, if we're going to go through life, it's nice to go through with somebody that has purpose, that's been there, that knows exactly where their pitfalls are, and the right ways to go, and the things to avoid, and the things to do. And that's really what the Bible provides us. And that's what Paul's talking about is here. He talks about, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing. Paul is giving us this, this picture of a God who has this, this purpose for us in the very beginning. So as we get into the book of Ephesians, it's important to know something about the book of Ephesians. One is that the book of Ephesians is known as one of the prison epistles. Have you heard that before? A prison, prison epistle. And there's four prison epistles. There's Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, and Philemon. And they're called prison epistles because they were all written by Paul while he was in prison in Rome. You know, Paul had three missionary journeys all through Europe. It's amazing when you really think about it because, I mean, he's been to more places in Europe than I have, and I had the benefit of Boeing 737s and 40, 747s and A-1011s, and I had all these jet airplanes that I could go anywhere I wanted to in Europe, and Paul's been to more places than I ever have been. And he did that in the days when the fastest you could go anywhere was by ship, and only if the wind was strong behind you because you never could go very fast. Um, so Paul wrote these four epistles from Rome, so they all have something in, in common. The book of Ephesians, however, is a little bit different. The book of, a lot of these other books were written to a specific church or to a specific person, like Philemon or Timothy, addressing a specific issue. Paul was responding to Corinth, the church in Corinth, and he was responding to them and answering questions that they had. When he wrote to the Romans, he was writing to them prior to getting there, blessing the church and trying to give them instructions, that things that they needed. But when he wrote to the Ephesians, it's very, very clear that at the very beginning of this, even though he's writing specifically to the church at Ephesus, this is a circular letter. This was a letter that was going to have applications to any Christians anywhere during the time of Paul and anywhere throughout eternity. So this, this, this epistle was written in a way that it could be shared. It had general themes and general huge themes. The purpose of God, the purpose of the church, the activities of the Christians. These are, these are huge themes that can be applied throughout history and throughout the church. So like I said, it's a little bit different some of, than some of the other New Testament letters, but in the same way, it's one of the letters that has tremendous meaning, tremendous theology to us. So let's take a look at some of the verses. In verse one and two, it says, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God to the saints who are in Ephesus and faithful in Christ Jesus, grace to you and peace from God the Father. So this, is, this looks like a typical greeting by Paul, but if you notice, it's pretty short. If you take a look at Philemon or Roman, some of, the, some of the initial greetings are actually a lot longer. And I think it kind of gives us an idea that Paul wanted to get to the meat. He didn't want to bury the lead. He wanted to get right into this and start telling us. In fact, in chapter one, there's so much theology 
That's why it's going to take us a while to even get through chapter one. There's so much in there. So this, this, even this greeting is relatively short because Paul wants to get directly into to the teachings. And it says, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, and it says, to the saints, to the saints. And I want to spend a couple of minutes just talking about that idea of saints. Do you consider yourself a saint? Do you consider yourself a saint? You should. You should. And see, often we don't. We don't for a couple of reasons. And I'll give you the two reasons. One is that in the Catholic Church, saints are people that have been identified by the church as being very, very holy. And as a result, we know that they're in heaven. Now, that's a difficult task. And I, my, my hat's off to the Catholic Church to be able to do that because it's very, very difficult. As a pastor, we want to teach good doctrine. We want to be able to present the gospel. But it's really up to the people to receive it. And sometimes, how do you know if they really receive it? Well, we know if they come to church, but coming to church alone isn't going to tell us whether they've really become a saint. Being baptized isn't enough to let us know that they've truly become a saint. You know, when Jesus met Nicodemus, this was the second year of Jesus' ministry, Jesus, Nicodemus comes to Jesus and he says, we know that you are a man of God because nobody can do the things that they've done unless God sends them. And Jesus responds to him and says, you've got to be born again. And then they have this interesting discussion about what, what does it mean to be born again and how is this done and things like that. But the important lesson that Jesus is teaching Nicodemus he says, you need the Holy Spirit. It's the Holy Spirit that actually changes your life. There's nothing that we can do. I can, I can take this Bible and I can memorize it. I can put it under my shoulder. I can drive around on Sunday and go to four or five different church services, but that's not going to change my heart. The thing that actually changes our heart is the Holy Spirit that comes into our life and actually changes us and makes us new. And this is what Jesus says. Jesus says the Holy Spirit is like the wind. He doesn't say it is the wind. He says it's like the wind in this case, that you can't, you can't see it coming, nor can you see it going, but you can feel the effect of it. And this is what, this is what Paul is talking about. He's calling the people saints. He's calling them saints. Now, the word saints in Greek is a word called hagios, and it means separated ones. Means people that are consecrated, people that are people that are holy, people that are holy. Now I've got a little bit of a story. Do you mind if I read you a little story? Okay. I, if you, if some of you know that I, I wrote a book a few years ago called Roaming Catholics, and it was to address some of the teachings within the Catholic Church that we need to understand. Whether you're Catholic or not, you need to understand some of these teachings because they're great teachings, and we we know what the history is. I've always felt if people understand the history of the church, they'll be able to get along much better. You know, when we saw this video a little while ago, Paul said that one of the themes in chapter four of the book of Ephesians is unity. The idea that, that we, all have, we all share a common faith. We all share a common Lord. We all share a common baptism. And we all share that. And that because of that, we have unity. And unity isn't uniformity or conformity, but it means that we're one in Christ. So I, I wrote the book specifically to address that issue. And I had a little a little couple paragraphs that I wrote about this whole idea of saint, and I'll read it to you. The Greek word translated saint is hagios, and it's found 200 times in the New Testament. It's often translated as holy, including the holy ones or holy places. When it refers to people, saints, it's always in reference to living, breathing people. It's always referred to people that are saints. Paul calls the people in Ephesus that are going to read this letter saints. The only exception to the living and breathing saints is in the book of Revelation that references saints that have died, been martyred, and also those that are praying, either living or dead. When persecution broke out in the Roman Empire against the church, many Christians were martyred. The original meaning of the word martyr is just witness. That's what martyr means. It means a witness. And these men and women were certainly witnesses of the faith because they took their faith to the ultimate and they were actually died for their faith. In the early church, Paul referred often to the early Christians as saints, even calling himself the least of all the saints. The early martyrs, the dead saints, were certainly witnesses of the faith and were honored just as Jewish tradition had honored the Old Testament patriarchs. So some of the early martyrs of the church were put up on a pedestal just like Abraham or Isaac or Jacob or Moses was. 
As the church grew, particularly when it became joined with the state, the tradition and use of the word saint obviously changed. Calling a living, per living person a saint, particularly using the word hagios, meaning separate or consecrated, and using the same word for those that had given their life and been martyred and honored seemed inappropriate. As a result, the word saint was reserved exclusively up until the time of the Reformation, up until the time of Calvin and Martin Luther and Zwingli. As a result, the word saint was reserved exclusively until the time of the Reformation for those that were already dead and had already proven faithful in their holiness through martyrdom. During the first few centuries of the church, people began to remember, honor, and even venerate the saints. As time went on, there was a number of unexplained, miraculous, or at least fortunate events that were attributed to requests being made to these saints. As a result, they became saints and honored in the church. Now, what was interesting is it wasn't until the 1200s, the 13th century, that there was actually a process of identifying who saints, who were saints and who weren't saints. It took 1300 years, 1200 years, is that something? Now, to this date, the Roman Catholic Church has canonized over 10,000 religious people that they call saints, but the majority of them, over 600, were within the last 100 years. Isn't that something? 600 of, 600 of 60 percent of all the saints of the, of the Catholic Church were identified just within the last 100 years. So this idea of, of saints being holy ones that have died and gone into heaven and we've identified as separate is relatively a recent, it's kind of a recent identification. 60% of all of the saints that have been identified by the Catholic Church have only been within the last 100 years. I thought you'd like that, kind of interesting. But this is, what, this is what Paul is calling us, though. He's calling us that we are living saints. We are people that, now he's not making a determination that if you're reading the book, you're a saint. You know, Paul knows better than that. Paul is like the rest of us. He knows that it's not what you say, it's what you do. It's not who you are, it's whose you are. You like that? It's not who you are, but whose you are. If you belong to Jesus, Russ Taff, a, a singer-songwriter from 25, 30 years ago that my wife and I know, used to, sing, he used to sing a song saying, if you belong to Jesus, if you belong to Jesus, then you're my brother and you're my sister. See, if you belong to Jesus, then, then we're one. I don't care what label you have. I don't care what church you go to. I don't care what type of Bible you read. But if you belong to Jesus, then you're my brother and you're my sister. And that's, that's a wonderful feeling. You know, here in Celebration, we have a wonderful feeling of this wonderful camaraderie between the, the churches. We, we know each other. We pray for each other. We encourage each other. And it's, it's a wonderful feeling because it's truly a feeling of unity. Now, that doesn't mean we're trying to convert each other into our way of thinking. That's okay. I mean, we have Catholics and we have Seventh-day Adventists and we have Baptists and we have Presbyterians. And that's, all, that's, all, that's great because each have a unique perspective, a unique teaching. But if they belong to Jesus, they're my brothers and they're my sisters. So let's talk a little bit about this book that was written to Ephesus. Uh, Paul had spent three years, if you read through the book of Acts, he had spent almost three years in Ephesus. Now, this is very unique because Paul was a traveling pastor. He planted churches. He was sent out to the Greeks. You know, Peter was the apostle to the Jews, but Paul went out to the Greeks, and he basically went out and, and preached the gospel anywhere he possibly could. But he spent three years... With the, with the Ephesians. He spent three years with them as their pastor, starting that church. So that's why this letter is so important for Paul. He wanted to, to write to them, encourage them. When he's, when he's writing to them, he's got them in his mind. He knows who they are. They're his people. They're his flock. So it also is it's a good reminder to us that even though the Bible says that in fact, the book of Ephesians says that there's apostles and there's prophets and there's teachers and there's pastors and evangelists. There's different offices. We call it the fivefold offices. And that all of us, regardless of what our calling is, are to basically lay roots down sometimes. Sometimes you still have to have roots. In order to be, a, I think, in order to be an effective evangelist, you, know what it, you need to have to know what it means to pastor a church. In order to be a good chaplain, You've got to know what it means to be able to minister to people uh, in a hometown, in a local church. You've got to be able to, to do that. And Paul did that very, very well. 
Paul says, blessed be the God and Father, this is verse three, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. I love that. Christ, Paul is saying this, Christ has done something for you. Not only has he blessed you temporally, meaning temporal things, he's healed you of your diseases, he's giving you a family, he's telling husbands and wives how they should be living together, he's telling husbands and wives how to bring up their children, he's, he's encouraging the church to have everything in common, to be able to provide for the unfortunate, to be able to be willing to share. Those are all temporal benefits. But he also says that he's blessed us in spiritual places. There's a, the true spiritual blessing is what we receive after we leave this earth. This is, this is temporary, whether it's seven years or 70 years or 700 years, this is, this is temporary. Everything that you see, the Bible says that everything that you see, everything that you touch, everything that's physical is temporary. It's subject to change. It eventually will pass away. But the true, the true things, the eternal things are the things that you, you can't see. You see, we, we can't see our spiritual blessings. We can't see God the Father. We can't see Jesus Christ sitting at the right hand of God the Father right now. We can't see what's in store for us. We can read about it. We can go to the book of Revelation and we can read about the heavenly Jerusalem. We can read about the streets of gold. We can read about that Jesus has prepared a place for us. We can read about these things, but we, we can't see them. But the true spiritual blessings of knowing who God is and understanding who he is is not the temporal blessings we have, but the eternal blessings. You know, when I was, uh, when I was down in, in Mexico, Mexico has a, very, has a very Asian influence. I don't know whether you knew that or not. There's a very Asian influence. The, the community where my son lives, most of the, the buildings are, are built by, by Asian architects. And they're, they're, they're fascinating buildings, but they're different than American buildings. They look different. And I don't mean they're Asian, meaning that they're Chinese. I, they're just different. Um, I was describing that the apartment building next to my son's um, was, was about 25 stories tall. And it was like, you know what Jenga blocks are? Jenga blocks, when you stack these blocks on top of each other and you try to pull things, some things out and then they all collapse. Well, it's like somebody had built the building out of Jenga blocks and then a four-year-old came and messed them up because the blocks were not on top of each other. They were kind of like precariously leaning different ways. And I was talking to my son and my daughter-in-law about that, and they said, that's, a, that's an Asian influence. And as I, as I realized that, I went around Mexico City and I realized that in a lot of the Mexican restaurants and a lot of the Mexican stores, they had Buddhas, you know, the big fat Buddhas. They had Buddhas there. And, and I'm not an expert at all in Buddhism, uh, I know a little bit about it, and I know that almost all of the benefits of Buddhism, and there's many benefits to Buddhism because it's a religion that talks about peace and love and harmony and balance and, and you know, all these uh, interesting things. They're all temporal. They're all temporal. They all have to do with getting along with each other and getting along in this world which are nice things. I mean, we all want to be able to get along with each other, but Paul's going way beyond that. He's talking about true spiritual blessings. In fact, he starts talking about that from beginning of time, God had a plan for us for eternity. At the beginning of time, God knew us and had not only us in his mind and in his heart, but he had a plan for us in all eternity. So God is gathering a people to himself that God's gonna be embraced and we're gonna to be together for eternity. I like that. So the blessing is ours. God's resources are there for us always. It speaks of an attitude of certainty and assurance. One of the things that Paul is giving us is this idea of, of assurance, that we're, we're confident that God has, has brought us into a relationship with him through Jesus Christ. Now the us, when, when Paul talks about us, he's including both Jews and Gentiles. There's going to be certain times in this book of Ephesians that God's speaking, that, Jesus, that Paul is speaking specifically to the Jewish people. He'll talk about the law. He'll talk about Moses. He'll talk about what, what we were under Abraham. And then, uh, and then he'll be talking also about the Gentiles. And often when he talks about the, the, the Gentiles, he talks about that we've been adopted in, adopted in. This concept of adoption is interesting, by the way. If you know people, have any of you, have you, do you have any adopted sons or daughters, anybody here? No? 
In a larger group, we would. Usually if I ask that at church, there's usually a few people that raise their hand and they've adopted children. It's always fun to see that. And adoption's interesting because, you know, you can't pick your kids. They, the kids just kind of come, right? I mean, you get whatever God gives you, you know? You know a couple, they get pregnant and they end up with some kids and they just got to deal with the kids. It's like, it's the deck, it's the cards in the deck that you got dealt with, you know? You got to deal with the kids. Good or bad, they're your kids and you love them. And then there's the adopted children. And adopted children are easy because they're typically picked. They're, they're special because they've been brought in. But all too often, the adopted child doesn't feel like a full member of the family. Isn't that sad? The adopted child doesn't feel like they're a full member of the, of the family. We've got, a, we've got really, really good friends over at church that have three boys, and they've adopted a girl from India. So the girl is this beautiful girl, but she looks different than the three boys. The three boys are these little Caucasian blonde haired kids and they've got this darker sister with long dark hair and doesn't look like them. And we're hoping that she doesn't feel like, just because she's been adopted, she doesn't feel that she's quite fit in. Well, here's the thing, and this is special, and you're gonna take this home. Tonight you're gonna to be thinking about it. You say, I've never thought about it like that before. But this is what's special. As believers, as believers, as Gentiles, and that's most of us, not all of us, but the rest of us that are Gentiles, that have been adopted in, before you start feeling a little different, that you're not quite like the kids that are the real children, remember that Jesus says that we're born again. So even though we've been adopted, we're also born into the same family. Isn't that cool? So you get both benefits. Not only have you been adopted in, meaning that God's chosen you, you just didn't end up, okay? It isn't just that you went to the maternity ward and you got what you got, okay? You've been chosen by God from the beginning of time. And not only that, but then the Bible clearly says that you've been born again into the family of God. So it's a double blessing, it's a double blessing. You get this, this adoption as children, but also have been born again into the family. So with that, there's a couple of doctrinal things in the book of Ephesians. I'm going to try to tackle one of them today, okay? Can I do that? It's, a, it's, a, it's an issue that's been dealing, that the church has been trying to deal with for 500 years, and I'm going to cover it in about 15 minutes. Because <laughs> that's the only time, that's the only, that's the amount of time I'm going to have it. I've spent a lot more time than 15 minutes on it. I've studied on it. I've argued about it. I've I've, I've written papers on it, and it's this topic of predestination. Predestination. You've heard of the topic, right, before? And people have come to me and they said, well, Pastor Ken, does, is, is predestination, is that biblical? Is that biblical? Is that biblical? And I said, well, here's the thing. It's biblical because it's in the Bible. In the book of Ephesians, twice it says that we've been predestined. We've been predestined. We've been brought in from the beginning of time. God, in his infinite knowledge, predestined us to be children of God. The question is, what does that mean? What's the application? What do you take away from it? So I'm gonna just spend a little bit of time on, just a short little time on predestination to try to confuse you. No, I'm here to enlighten you, not confuse you. And, and here's the thing, there are, there are very, very smart theologians. Remember we did this when we talked about uh, the book of Revelation, when I talked about prophecy. I'm going to give you my teaching and what I basically believe the Bible teaches at the same time, we realize that there are people that are much smarter than I am, that on both sides, that, that may argue that I don't have it quite right. But let me tell you a little bit about my, my understanding of, of predestination. In Romans 8, Paul says, for those, God, for those God foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the likeness of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brothers, and those he predestined, he also called, and those he called, he justified, and those he justified, he glorified. Okay? Sounds like God's in charge, right? Mm -hmm. God's in charge. That's what that's saying. In Ephesians 1, that's where we are right now, verse 5, it says, He predestined us to be adopted as his sons through Jesus Christ in accordance with the pleasure of his will. In him we have also been chosen, having been predestined according to the plan of him who works out everything in conformity with the purpose of his will. So this idea of predestination is it's, it's all about God and God choosing us. God choosing us. Now, 
the biggest objection, the biggest objection to this teaching of the Bible, it's a biblical teaching, the question is how does it apply? The biggest objection to this concept thinking that God chose us, that I don't have much choice in it, is this idea that it doesn't quite seem fair. Seems a little unfair, okay? Why would God choose certain individuals and not others? Because that's what it assumes. If God has chosen us, that means that he hasn't chosen others. Why would that be? The important thing to remember is that no one, no one actually deserves to be saved. Nobody deserves it, okay? All, the Bible says that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. It's almost as this, it's almost like this. And I know this is a, this is a strange example because anytime I try to, to compare the righteousness of God and the choice of God in this idea of election and his purposes in eternity to something that we can relate to, it's, we're, gonna, we're gonna miss it, but let's, let's assume this. Let's assume that, that we're on the Titanic and I've got a lifeboat and I'm grabbing as many people as I can, okay? And I run down to the other side because there's a family down there that's got three or four kids and I wanna make sure that they get on the lifeboat, okay? And I try to get as many people on the lifeboat as possible. I'm choosing people. Now the thing is, is the boat is going down. Without the lifeboat, they're all gonna die. The fact that I get some people on the lifeboat doesn't make me unjust, it makes me, what would I be called? A hero, right? I would be a hero. I would actually go and save a few. I would be able to go and save a few of the people that are on the Titanic. Now, I, again, I said, remember before I even started this, this comparison is false, very, very fall, way short of the majesty and the the ability of God's foreknowledge of being able to predestine us and to bring us into fellowship with his son. But the idea is this, is that without God, without a plan of salvation, without Jesus Christ, none of us, none of us merit salvation. No matter how hard we try, we can't reach up to heaven. I mean, we could, I mean, there's, what, it was 18 of us here. I could get on dad's shoulders and we could have John and dad and I and, and Barney and, and we, we could all kind of form a pyramid and try to reach up, but we're never gonna get up to heaven. I mean, it would be completely futile. I mean, it'd be ridiculous. They say, Pastor Ken, what are you doing? We're trying to reach heaven. We're trying to get up there. We're trying to, you say, you need a lot more people. And even with a lot more people, you're not gonna reach it. And that's the point. That's the point that none of us really merit salvation. Now, if God is choosing who is saved, doesn't that undermine our free will to believe in Christ? See, here's the thing, if, if there is no free will, if we really don't have any choice in what we do, if God kind of, it's called determinism, by the way, determinism, if God determines everything. In fact, you know, there's a lot of atheists that believe it. Did you know that? A lot of atheists believe that everything is like a clock, that it's all been wound up. Everything's been wound up and we all, we all kind of like march to the same beat. And you know, like if you throw a ball, we know exactly where it's gonna go. It's gonna bounce here, bounce there, bounce there, bounce there, bounce there, and eventually end up over the, the sidewalk. It's all been determined. So it's and not only Christians, but atheists also have this, this problem with determinism. Well, the thing is, is that that's not what free will is about. Because if there is no free will, then this is the biggest illusion we've ever seen. Because it sure seems like at any given time I can stand up or sit down or walk out or, or choose to go to my studies or choose to go to work in the morning. The alarm goes off. I have a choice of whether I want to go to work or not, right? I, I have choices. We all have choices in life. So if we don't have choices, this has been a, a very, a, very strange simulation of some kind because it sure seems like we have choice. The Bible says we have choices. It says that all who believe in Jesus will be saved. That's John 3, 16 and Romans 10, 9. The Bible never describes God rejecting anyone who believes in him or turning away anybody that seeks him. Not once in the Bible does it ever say that God will ever turn away anybody that seeks him. Somehow, in the mystery of God, predestination works hand in hand with free will. It works the same way. One of the problems we have as humans is we think of either, either or. Is the light on or is the light off? Okay, am I alive or am I dead? 
Did I have breakfast or did I go hungry? But in the spiritual world, it's not that way. We say often that both things exist at the same time. God is able to do both and, both and. Both and. Predestination works in hand in hand with the idea of free will. Now, what I'm teaching you is something that I've come to believe. I think it's a great way to illustrate that we are one body, one faith. You can be on one side of the issue of predestination. You can be on the other side of the issue. We've got some churches that talk about predestination and Calvinism every single week of the month. I mean, every single week they're talking about it, that it's all predestined, that you've got no choice. And you've got other churches that are called free will, free will Baptist church, free will Bethanist church, okay? And, and it seems like they're apart. What I've just told you is a way to try to bring it together that in the mysteries of God, God has the ability to do both. God has the ability to give us free will and at the same time understand that it's all according to his pleasure and according to his good will. Do you like that? Is that okay? I didn't confuse you? Just a little, right? Just a little, okay. Let's go on. Paul goes on, he says, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love. You see, we're chosen by God, not only for salvation, but also for holiness, this idea of hagio, this idea of being a saint. Not only are we chosen to be saved, but we're also chosen to be holy. We're to be representatives of Jesus Christ. You know, often I tell people that the only Jesus people are ever going to see are you. That's it. I mean, we are the, the body, the, the Bible calls us that we are the body of Christ. And I think that means that literally as well as figuratively, we are the body of Christ. If somebody's going to give a cup of cold water in Jesus' name, it's going to be you and me. If somebody's going to reach out to somebody with the gospel, the Bible says that the, the gospel, Jesus said that we are supposed to go and share the good news, the gospel of Jesus Christ with all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. But the only one that's going to do that is, is us. So we're not only called to our own unique salvation, meaning something that happens inside of us, but we're also empowered to go out, to go out. We're called not only for salvation, but we're also called for holiness. And it says, having predestined, that's that word again, this is verse 11, to, to adoption as sons by Jesus Christ himself. Um, now, one of the th things that's interesting, and I'll, I'll end our lesson today with this, it says, to the praise of the glory of his grace, by which he made us accepted in the beloved. And you'll see often in the Bible that it talks about the glory of God, for the glory of God, for the glory of God, for the glory of God. And one of the things that I teach often is we have to understand that everything that God has done, everything that he's done is for his glory. It's for his glory. It's for his glory. And the reason is, is because he truly deserves the glory. I mean, he deserves the glory. It's, it's one thing for a football player to catch a touch, touchdown and do a little dance in the, in the end zone, right? And he's kind of a glory hog. But that's not, what, that's not what God is doing, okay? God is the one that created the football player, created the football, created the stadium, created the earth that, that's revolving around his son that he created in order for us to have everything that we have. God created it all. And as a result, everything that God does has to be uniquely only for his glory. Otherwise, why would he do it? It's all for him. And we see this often in the Bible. If you, dis, if you disagree with me, just listen to this. God created everything through himself and for himself. That's Colossians 1.16. In Psalm 19, it says, he created the world to declare his glory. In Ezekiel, it said, he rescued the Israelites for the sake of his namesake, so he would not be profaned among the nations. I mean, the reason that God had a people and he would rescue Israel, even though they fell into sin, is so that his glory would be seen among the Gentiles. In Ezekiel, it says, he'll make a new covenant with his people, promising them a new heart and spirit, not for their sake, but for the sake of his holy name, for his glory. He guides us in path of righteousness, Psalm 23, for his namesake or for his glory. In Isaiah 40, it says, he delays his wrath for his own namesake and for the sake of his praise, and he will not yield his glory to another. This is for the glory of God. Um, he allows some people to die for his glory, Lazarus. 
Jesus was said, they said, you know, what, what, why, why is Jesus says this? I'm, I am glad that Lazarus has dead so that you will see the glory of the Lord. Glory of the Lord. Lazarus was allowed to die for the glory of the Lord. Now, remember, we are puny, puny little human beings, okay? God is this big God. We are these little teeny people. It's difficult to us for us to understand how all of these things work for God's glory, but they do. Somehow they work for his, for his glory. Is that good? Okay, so we've taken you through the beginning of Ephesians. We understand where it came. We got to see a cool little video flick, right? The whole pictures. Isn't that cool how they draw all of that? It's amazing. Um, we've introduced a little bit about Paul and his letter to the Ephesians. We've actually gotten through one of the doctrines, which is predestination. We've actually talked about the whole idea of saints and where they came from, saints versus martyrs. I call that a good day, don't you? Yep. I think I call it a good day. Yes, Suzanne. And then he went back to heaven. That's the core. That's right. All That's the gospel. Other They're just doctrines. That Christians argue about. Yeah. Yep. I agree. I agree. When one of the things that that's that's a great point. One of the things that we did, and I've 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 recommended. I've had three or four churches actually change their statement of faith. Can you imagine? I never thought I'd have this kind of influence on people. But I'll do some consulting. And one of the things I do is I, in, I reintroduce a church to the Nicene Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, the Son, who was born of a virgin Mary, you know, died under Pontius Pilate, rose again on the third day, coming back again, the Holy Spirit. This is, this is the creed of the church. This was, this was written in 323 AD. And it's the basic fundamentals of the faith. So if you go to our website at Faith Dialogue, and we are a church also, is you'll see that our statement of faith is the Nicene Creed. It's the thing that every single church that calls themselves a church that we have fellowship with, like Russ Taft said, you're my brother and you're my sister, will believe in the Nicene Creed. All the other things that they add sometimes to their statement of faith, all they tend to do, they do two things. One, they define that church a little bit more closely so that people might understand where they're teaching. But really what it does is it separates them from another group of people. So again, remember I just, I just got done teaching a prophecy series and we talked about the second coming of Christ and we talked about the idea of the millennial reign of Christ. And understand that when we teach that, we teach it because it's in the Bible. We think oh, that that's, that's my role as a pastor is to teach you what I believe is in the Bible. It's not in my statement of faith. And the reason it's not in my statement of faith is exactly to Suzanne's point, which is I don't wanna separate myself from other people. Because whether you believe that or not really doesn't matter, okay? The thing that matters is who you are in Christ. Or better what I say is what whose you are. Whose you are. Because whose you are is gonna make the difference, all the difference in the world. So let me pray. Father God, we wanna thank you for this day. Thank you, Lord. You've been listening to Faith Dialogue with Pastor Ken Baer, recorded live at Celebrate Seniors, a ministry of Faith Dialogue. You can listen to or watch all of the recordings at Faith Dialogue by going to www.faithdialogue.org.